الناس بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فبشر وأنذر ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا مولانا محمد عبد الله ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة فجزاه الله عنا وعن كل المسلمين خيرا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد رب يسر ولا تعسر وتمن بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علم ولهقني بالصالحين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا فهم لنا إلا ما فهمتنا إنك أنت الجواد الكريم My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam When a person absolves themselves from personal responsibility in regards to any given matter or they pin it to qadr, faith and the will of Allah as a reason of that certain matter coming into existence then to me I categorize this as abuse of religion and it is exactly because of this reason that whenever anything happens or a call is made for us to be a part of making something better and we shun or shy away or turn away and say, this is the qadr of Allah. Or Allah had wished for this to happen, so I don't need to do anything about it. This is the reason why this nation of goodness, this nation of divine revelation, the representatives of Allah, the followers of Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are exactly where they are in great loss. It is truly mind-boggling when someone can make a statement defining a certain matter to be what it means to them using the faith. Many a times you hear people who are considered religious from our peers, elders, members of the family or society that just say the statement or they utter this statement, we are in times of fitna. We are in times of fitna. Or again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to be as such. Or, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa foretold, he prophesied of such a time, he said it's going to happen, and it's happening. So just make dua. Just make dua. Today I want us to ask ourselves a very simple question. What is the reality of such statements in our religion? Can we say such things? Is it justifiable? Is our position correct when we say this thing? Because what I understand, such statements 
are the reason why people are running from this religion. For it seems that we are saying destiny has taken control of us and the situations that are plaguing us, and we are helpless. We are helpless. The most we can do is pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you accept this analogy, if you say this is how it is, Imam, then I ask you a simple question. When you or anyone you know of is inflicted with a personal dilemma, a predicament, a trauma, do you not run to people seeking help or prayers or intervention? Allah forbid there was a fire in your house. Would you sit down in the lawn and say, Allah wanted it to happen. Don't call 911. See your house burn to the ground because Allah wanted it to happen. If you were to come to me, and I'm like, I want to make this personal, you come to me or any of the scholars and say, Imam, Sheikh, I need help. My child needs help. My marriage needs help. I'm really suffering in my home. I need your help. I don't know what's going on. And I say to you, it's a fitna. Allah, Allah had intended this to be this way. The Prophet Muhammad foretold of a time that children will be disrespectful to their parents. So live with it. It's fine. I know and you know that you won't accept that. You will not accept that. You will stay and you will be adamant that we need to do something. I need to do something. We will plead and cry. You know why? Because it's personal. Because it's personal. Did you hear that word? Personal. This is exactly what has gone wrong with the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The world means little to nothing in our eyes. We don't take any of the problems of the world today to be personal. We just shrug it off, shove it to Allah. Allah, you, you, you said it's going to happen, right? You do it. You take care of it. These shayateen and these kuffar and these fitna are happening. That's how we talk. This is what I call the talk of shaitan. A'udhu billah. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa never ever said Allah wanted the tribes to fight. Allah wanted bloodshed in Arabia. Allah wanted them to bury their daughters alive. Allah wanted them to drink from the skulls of their enemy. Allah wanted them to abuse women. Allah wanted them to abuse children. Allah wanted it. It's qadr that it happened. The Prophet ﷺ fought against it. He stood up against it. He stood with a firm stance and position against the norm until he made what he believed in the norm in society. Remember one thing, my dear friends. Shaitan will use the religion to justify our stance in the religion. And when we do that, we need to ask ourselves a simple question. Did Rasulullah sallallahu do this? Many of the people who don't care about the world, who don't care about what's happening in our neck of the woods, will say the hadith, of, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Adunya malgoon wa malgoon ma fiha, illa dikr Allahi wa ma wala." This earth, they'll say, "I'm not saying this." Okay, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying this: that this earth is cursed. Everything in it is cursed, except for the remembrance of Allah and those who are attached to it. So, if the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying it's cursed, why should I care about it? I ask those same people today. Why did Allah say the following? وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقْوَاتَهَا فِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَّامِ Why then? We need to ask questions. Why then? 
did Allah say about the same earth that the Prophet Muhammad said is cursed? That we are taking it in a, may, in a way to justify we have nothing to do with the world because it's a curse. But Allah is saying He put the mountains on this earth. He spread the blessing and He spread the sustenance on it. In four days, four days Allah spent in making this earth. I ask you, what kind of curse is it then? Why did Allah spend so much time on this earth if you and I are only supposed to say it's a curse? Because to me, that's a waste of time. And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Holy Quran, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab If this earth is so bad, if what this world is all about is only evil and vice and wickedness, then why did Allah teach you and I to make the supplication, O oh our Lord, give us in this world goodness. Give us in the next world goodness and protect us from the fire of hell. How can we ask for goodness in the very same place that we consider to be the curse because of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I hope you understand where I'm going here. I'm trying to put things in perspective, and I'm hoping that we change our current mindset. The hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the curse is authentic. It is a sahih hadith that this earth is cursed and whatever in it is cursed, but it's not telling us to despise the world. It is telling us to own the world and take the remembrance of Allah to all corners and facets of the world. Because when the remembrance of Allah becomes part and parcel of our home, of our workplace, of our masajid, of our cars, of our possession, of the parks that we play in, the grocery stores that we walk in, the malls that we shop in. When you take Allah's remembrance into those places, you are eliminating the possibility of the curse sitting on it. That is why when you walk into the mall or you walk into the store, you say the kalima, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la, lahu al mulk wa lahu al hamd, yuhi wa yumeet, bihadi al khair, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Why? Because as a Muslim, your job is to take this goodness everywhere so that no place on this earth is a curse. Illa dhikr Allahi wa man wala. Except for the remembrance of Allah and those who are connected with the remembrance of Allah. Take the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah is not just the utterance of words, but it's a representation of goodness. Take it to the world, and I promise you, you will eliminate the curse from becoming a curse. It is just like taking every carton of milk that you have in your home and putting it into the fridge, preventing it from spoiling. Today, my dear friends, I want to speak about the fitna of the misconstrued concept of fitna. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to broaden our understanding of the deen that encompasses all that he taught and intended for us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. The world, the word today is fitna. The word is fitna, used very lightly and in almost every conversation where the discussion of religion and the world comes to play. I'm not here today to give you the historical meaning of fitna, so I don't expect you to wait for me to talk about how fitna means trial or test or how it's uh, uh, the plural of it is fitan or how it also could mean temptation or seduction or civil strife or how it was used in the past as a goldsmith who used to burn the gold uh, in order to see if the gold was real or not. We're not going to go into history here. This is not a history lesson. Today, we want to understand fitna in the context of our current time and place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran uses the term fitna in many places under many contexts. It's imperative that we understand the context of those places that he used it in and also the categories. 
If you take all the words of fitna in the Quran, you can summarize it in three specific categories. Number one, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about fitna to his creation in reference to himself, he spoke of it as a trial, i.e. a means of testing authenticity. A means of testing authenticity. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." When he says this, he means that through acquisition of wealth or the loss of it, through having child, children or losing children, this is the way I will try you. I will test you to see how firm you are in your faith. Everything is a test. Never ever assume for the slightest moment in your life that you are not being tested. Because if you do, you are negating a verse of the Holy Quran in Surah al kabut verse number 2, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear, do the people assume, because they've just said La ilaha illallah and they've become believers, that Allah is not going to test them? So when Allah talks about fitna in context to Himself, He's telling us that everything He's doing to you, and everything that He will do to you, and everything that He has done to you is merely a test from Him. The goal and the purpose is clear. He wants to see how true you are to Him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Ibrahim alayhi salam to take his son and a knife and go away and slaughter his son, Allah did not want to promote murder and killing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing Ibrahim alayhi salam in his own way to see how true he was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember, every state of affairs in your life, every condition you face, adverse or not, is a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will test you to see how true you are to your word, to your word so always be ready. If a person says today, alhamdulillah, life couldn't be better, that's a test. If a person says, I have more than I ever needed, that's a test. If a person says, I haven't faced the worst day in my life till today, that's a test. And if a person has lost everything that they worked hard for today, that's also a test. Number two. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, spoke about fitna, he spoke of it in regards to temptations and distractions. He foretold and told us, he prophesied Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of times where adultery will become the norm. Of times where children will disrespect their parents. Of times where bloodshed will become so common and normal. Why did he tell us this? Again, in context of him telling us fitna, it wasn't so that we give in to it and say it was prophesied, it's happening, so we need to sit back and be quiet and pray about it. He told us of these fitan, these fitnas, so that when they do occur, we reinforce the values of Islam to stop them from continuing. When bloodshed becomes the norm in your world, you have to stand up clearly, loudly, and articulate the importance of preservation of life. That's what the Prophet Muhammad did. And when adultery becomes the norm, you need to reinforce the importance, the significance, and value of marriage in Islam. Because that's what the Prophet Muhammad did. And when people say that this is the curse of time, that my children don't listen to me or they talk back to me, you are to reinforce the values of parents and children in your homes and in your society because that's what the Prophet Muhammad did. How to handle this fitna has also been taught. Not to say that it's going to happen, it was supposed to happen, Allah destined for this to happen, so we have no choice. 
You have every choice. You have the power. You have the choice, the power, and the ability to bring about change. Never allow these sentences that this is a fitna or destined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you feel that you are helpless or otherwise. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He opens our hearts and minds. He forgives us for our shortcomings and He forgives us for our inability to bring about goodness in a world that's plagued with turmoil. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us with His divine light. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'iduhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina. ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد brothers and sisters in Islam today once more we're talking about the term fitna and how it is being misused and abused amongst the Muslims in the Muslim community. And how we're using it as justification for what's happening in our world and to continue to allow it to happen because it's the will of Allah. Or it was foretold by the Prophet Muhammad Now that we put those two in context, I want us to understand the third and final context of the word fitna. And that is the man-made fitna which can be defined as civil strife. People who love to sow the seeds of chaos, discord, disunity, problems, turmoil in their homes, in their communities, and in their world. And when things go all out, they say, I didn't intend for this. I was just having some fun. Who are these people? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines them in various places of the Holy Quran. In chapter number 22, verse number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفِ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرُ نِقْمَ أَنَّبِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتُ فِتْنَةً انْقَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينِ those that you will see causing this disru- disruption and this decay in our society are people who worship Allah, they use religion, but they're always on the edge of religion. Why? Because if they get good, they say, yeah, this religion is good. But if they are struck with a trial from Allah, they turn their face from Allah. People who use the religion the amount of harm that has been perpetrated on this earth around the globe using religion is more than anything else. When people call on people to turn on people because the ways of those people are not the likes of their people, this is called fitna. These are the people that Allah is saying that cause disruption and decay and discord in our society. When they see good in the religion for themselves, they say, yeah, the religion is good. But when things go rough, when the going gets tough and the tough gets going, they turn from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear. Khasira dunya wal akhira. They are lost in this world and they're lost tomorrow. And that's the greatest loss anyone can incur. May Allah protect us all from such a loss. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. What is the crime of these people? Their goal, as I said, to pin one person against another. The Prophet Muhammad knew about the hypocrites in his society. He knew who they were, but he never spoke about it. Because his message, his presence was very clear. I'm not here to cause problems. I'm here to solve problems. And you are the Ummah of Rasulullah We're not here to cause problems. We're here to solve our problems so we can solve the world's problems because those problems are problems waiting for solution from you. That's what Allah wants. 
That's what Allah wants. That you solve it, not that you sit back and say, Allah made it to be so. I'll give you an example our teacher told us once. It's a very interesting story. He said one day the king went to one of his wise men in the kingdom. And he spoke to him and said, you know, I don't think my wife loves me anymore. He said, why do you say so? He said, because I feel that we're distant. He goes, what you do is you wake up in the middle of the night. Wake up in the middle of the night and look at her. If she's resting peacefully, she's sleeping, then everything will be fine. She loves you. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay, I make it a point to wake up at one in the morning, giving an example. Now, interestingly, the wife of the king, the queen, she comes to the same minister, to the same wise person, and says, you know, I don't think the king loves me anymore. How do you say so? Well, because, you know, there's this going on and that going on. The people, I'm going to stop here, the people who love hearing stories are the ones who love causing problems also. So you know what he said? I'll tell you something. Wake up in the middle of the night. Get the scissor. Sleep with the scissors. In the middle of the night, you wake up. When he's fast asleep, cut a few pieces of his beard and bring it to me. I will do some prayer and see if he truly loves you or not. In his heart, is only concern for his relationship. In her heart is a concern for the relationship. In the wise man's heart is the destruction of this family. So now this king is asleep and he wakes up. He wakes up because he wants to do what the wise man told him to do. And when he wakes up, he sees before his eyes his wife with the scissors coming down on his throat. He said, you truly hate me. You were trying to kill me. And he took it and he stabbed her. And he killed her. This is exactly what Fitna is all about. Allah made two statements in the Quran. In chapter number 2, verse number 191, and verse number 272, uh, 217 of the same chapter. Wal fitna Fitna is severe than killing. Wal fitna tu akbaru min al Fitna is graver than killing. All it will lead to is loss of life, loss of property, failure to uphold trust appointed to humankind. Do not be the fitna that Allah didn't want you to be. Be the solution to the fitan of our time and of our people. In a hadith, the Prophet Muhammad said, As doomsday approaches, fitna will increase. It will resemble the increase in darkness as night begins. It'll be like the darkness of the night. A person will leave their home in the morning as a believer and they will return home as disbelievers in the evening. Or they will be Muslims in their home in the evening and they will lose their faith overnight. I.e. these practices will take away the essence of our faith. And we will only be Muslims by name, but we will have no Islam within us. So when this picks up, him, her, them, they, these people, those people, us and them, when this disunity and fractioning begins and you are part of the discussion, the Prophet ﷺ said, during such time, stay at your home. It is better than being involved in the fitna. Those who stay aloof are better than those who attack and lead in front on that day. Because remember, mark my words, if we don't stop the fitna happening on a small scale, between brothers and sisters, between friends and family, between members of the community, all it's going to lead to is what we're seeing on the grand scale, which is war, turmoil, killing, dropping bombs, killing innocent people. It's all that's going to happen. It's all that's going to happen. Don't blame the people doing it up there when we know it's happening down here. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ said, because he knew, despite giving us this advice, that some of us are not going to take heed. Some of us will say, oh, it's a small thing. He said, leave your weapons. 
Leave your weapons. Never pick up your arms on each other. Never pick up your finger on each other. Never pick up your fist on one another. Because the brother and sister's life and their property and their honor is sanctified. It is something you should not touch or violate. The Prophet says at the end of this hadith, address everybody with a smiling face and sweet words. Once the Prophet stood over one of the high buildings of Medina and he said to the people, Do you see what I see? They said, No. He said, I see afflictions falling among your houses as raindrops fall. What are the fitnas today? It is our failure to understand our priorities. What is the fitna today? Our failure to come together. What is the failure? Uh, what is the fitna today? Our failure to preserve our work longer than ourselves. Let us not be like that woman that Allah talks about in the Holy Quran. She was a woman who had some disorder. She would make this weaving machine in the morning and nighttime she'd pick it up and smash it. Let us not build Islam today and smash it before we die. Let us not build our institutions today and smash it before we go in our grave. Let us not build our communities and rip them apart before we die because this is the biggest fitna that we failed in. I end by saying the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ That Allah saying, we have made some of you for others a test and a trial. Will you not bear with patience? We send salutations and blessings upon Muhammad and Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who guided us, who mentored us, who advised us from the depths of his heart as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad abdika wa rasulika al nabi al ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqa wa rizukna atiba'a wa arina al ba'a وقنا باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابا اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والإسيان واجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا وأصلح ذات بيننا واهدنا سبل السلام وجنبنا الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم اشف مرضانا اللهم اشف مرضانا وعا بمبتلانا وارحم موتانا يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون Please ensure that our lines are straight, stand shoulder to shoulder. The edge of our heels should be on the edge of the line. Please ensure the line in front of us is complete from both sides before we form a second line. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول